Institute's annual economics convention, Conclave 2015. This session's topic of discussion is foreign direct investment have we done enough? With more than two decades after opening up of the Indian economy, FDI inflows into India have been steadily rising in importance since the early 2000s. While India has already marked its presence as one of the fastest growing economies of the world, and with the 12th five-year plan already in action to boost infrastructure growth, the question that arises is that have we done enough with respect to FDI to sustain India's growth trajectory? To elucidate on a topic of discussion, we have with us our very esteemed guest, Professor Nagesh Kumar. Professor Nagesh Kumar is currently the head of United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, South and Southwest Asia office. Prior to this, he was the chief economist and director of the Macroeconomic Policy and Development Division at UNESCAP headquartered in Bangkok. Prior to joining UNESCAP, he served for seven years as the Director General of the Research and Information System for Developing Countries, which is a New Delhi-based public funded development policy think tank. He also served on the faculty of the United Nations University Institute for New Technologies based in Maastricht, the Netherlands. He served as a consultant to the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, UNDP, UNDESA, IEO, Commonwealth Secretariat, among many others. He was nominated by the Government of India on track to study group on comprehensive economic partnership of East Asian countries. A PhD in economics from the Delhi School of Economics, he is the recipient of the Exim Bank of India's first international trade research award in 1989 and a Julian Medal for Best Research awarded by the World Bank and the Japanese government in 2000. He has written extensively on development cooperation, developmental impact of FDI, industrial and technology development policies, the challenge of new technologies, regional cooperation, WTO and development. On behalf of the faculty and the students of Gokhale Institute, I extend a very warm welcome to you, sir. I now invite you to come up on stage and begin this afternoon session. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me begin by saying that uh, it's such a pleasure and privilege to be part of Gokhale uh, Institute's. Uh, Annual Economics Conclave, and I have uh, just uh, taken a round of your campus, very historic, very refreshing, very interesting campus, and very nice body of students, young people uh, trying to uh, get knowledge, and I'm very happy and very pleased to be with you this afternoon. Now. Uh, about the theme of the, this particular oh, I can just want to for my own. Well, uh, I'm going to uh, share with you some thoughts about FDI and economic development. India's experience in global comparative perspective, whether we have done enough as the team who, uh, you know, suggested to me was. And the context I will put it in is this current discussion on Make in India. And there is a lot of uh, expectation or hope pinned down on foreign direct investment. India, you know, attracting foreign direct investment and uh, make it sort of a, a manufacturing hub after becoming a services hub uh, in the world uh, just as some of the East Asian economies have become. Uh, China is the latest uh, in that series of East Asian economies after Japan and Republic of Korea. So uh, what I will be uh, doing is India performance in, uh, I will be talking about India performance in attracting FDI and making it work. 
So the quantity and quality. And uh, uh, when I say quality, you, have, I, you must be wondering what I mean about that. Basically, I mean from quality of FDI uh, is the ability to accept value uh, from FDI because after all, you look up uh, look up to FDI to do something to contribute to your development and uh, not only uh, you know directly but indirectly also to spillovers and externalities, positive externalities. So the ability to absorb positive externalities from FDI, you know, all that is the qualitative aspect of it. And some policy lessons will conclude with it. Now, you may be maybe familiar with this. There is approach or attitude or policy towards foreign direct development has changed over time. It has evolved over time. Uh, when in the beginning, in 1947, in the 1960s, and all that, the attitude was very accommodating, uh, liberal uh, towards foreign direct investment because the general feeling was that we lacked many of the uh, resources that are needed for industrialization of the country, uh, in particular uh, access to technology. The savings base was also very small. India's savings rate was only 7% in 1950, if you like. And uh, so savings uh, base, uh, the capital base was very small, the technology was virtually non existent, and uh, uh, entrepreneurship and all other resources, organizational capacity uh, was needed, managerial capacity, organizational capacity was needed to be supplemented. And so the country opened the doors to foreign capital. But as the domestic base of uh, the capacities, in terms of uh, some ability to produce some capital equipment, and as the supply of local investments increased, uh, the policy was tightened a uh, little bit in the 1960s. And that process continued, or that policy continued, until uh, the 1980s. Uh, 1980. And this was a period when a uh, very unpopular kind of uh, you know, regulation, which is called FERA, foreign exchange was brought in to bring down the ownership of foreign control companies. But in the 1980s, uh, when uh, there was a feeling that we have, India had left behind in terms of global competitiveness of its uh, manufacturing, its products, and all that. Again, there was a selective opening towards for direct investment. And since 1991, uh, it has been uh, following, India has been following a policy of uh, full scale liberalization towards FBI uh, as a part of reforms. And just to give you an idea of uh, what uh, we have been doing since 1991. Actually, uh, this liberalization of FDI policy was part of a larger series of reforms, which included, I mean, there was a new industrial policy introduced uh, in 1991 by Dr. Van who eventually became uh, the country's prime minister. At that time, as a finance minister, he brought a number of changes or reforms. And the big picture of uh, those reforms included not just uh, FBI, I and mean, I was part of it because uh, it also included dismantling of uh, industrial licensing system. Uh, it was uh, a process that you could not start or establish a large scale industry without obtaining first and uh, approval or a license, license from the government. And that was a one uh, single uh, regulation that sort of uh, was a big anti barrier, uh, policy induced anti barrier for uh, industrialization. And that was completely dismantled. And then, the number of new industries, you know, before this 1991. The number of industries were exclusively reserved for public sector or you know, government-owned uh, uh, you know, industrial activity. 
So that was also done away with the or generalized very uh, greatly. And so a number of industries and services were open to private sector. For instance, telecom. You know, you knew at that time there was this monopoly of uh, LTNL or BSNL, no private sector there. Insurance was LIC monopoly. Uh, construction of roads, ports, airlines, there were no private companies in these sectors. So these were reserved for uh, public sector, but these were open, uh, thrown open to private sector investments and mining for another sector. So uh, FDI liberalization was part of the bigger picture of uh, reforms, uh, which included all types of liberalization. And in terms of the FBI policy specifically, uh, the, there was a greater transparency in the approval system was introduced. So, for instance, uh, there was an automatic approval uh, introduced on, I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, change it on the screen. Uh, I'm changing it on my computer. But, uh, So, uh, so basically, what I'm saying is that greater transparency in the policy was brought in uh, with an automatic uh, approval process uh, for certain industries. So guidelines were uh, defined. If you follow the guidelines, you get an automatic approval. So you don't need to wait for a, in a queue to get an approval. Uh, and the other approval, uh, applications were subject to an approval system, but even there, you know, there were sort of norms defined that you will get a, a license, or uh, if, if they can't give you a license, then they will tell you so in so many days. So, so there were those kind of uh, norms defined. Then 100% ownership uh, was allowed in most of the manufacturing sectors. So before that, there were restrictions that you can't, a foreign investor cannot own more than 40 percent, or in some industries, 51 percent. So uh, now you could have 100 percent subsidies, 100 percent or wholly owned subsidies in most of the manufacturing sector. Although in some services sectors, there were separate caps. For instance, you read in newspapers about uh, the FBI limit or ownership limit in insurance. Is increased from 25% to 49%. You know, so those kind of sectoral caps is still applied, but they are gradually being uh, you know, liberalized. Then performance requirements. These are some set of regulations which were imposed on uh, foreign investors when they enter the country that you have to undertake uh, some proportion of your output in exports. Or you have to have the local content requirements that you, you know you will buy a certain proportion of your inputs locally, uh, or you will produce them locally. So those kind of restrictions were also uh, done away with. Yes. Now, so that 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 by way of background that uh, what a change in terms of policy. But in terms of uh, uh, determinants of uh, inflows, because I'm going to uh, share with you how India has emerged as a more attractive place for contract investment, and uh, what actually determines uh, the FDI inflows to a particular country. And there are many studies uh, of the determinants of contract investment, and one particular one uh, I'm referring to here uh, is uh, something which I did myself. Uh, it was a three dimensional analysis of 74 countries, three points of time, uh, you know, some key sectors of uh, uh, you know, uh, economic activity, and two sources of uh, investment, uh, US and Japan. And when you did that uh, analysis, of course, a very large data set, including uh, three or four dimensions, uh, you found a pattern. A pattern was, uh, I mean, uh, I'm talking in terms of uh, an economic exercise. The patterns uh, uh, was uh, 
that the country purchasing like power had a higher share of uh, for that investment. Growth prospects were uh, also seen as very important determinant for driver of foreign direct investment. So companies, before investing in a country, take a view of what, how, how much budgetary power is there today, and what will be growth potential uh, in coming years. The infrastructure is, uh, you know, availability was a very key factor. Tax rates and incentives, of course, matter, but not as much as infrastructure. And uh, one thing is not listed here that was also found very important, which is the extent of urbanization. Multinational countries typically target uh, urban consumers through advertising, through marketing, and so the uh, proportion of urban population was also very important uh, driver uh, or determinant uh, of FBI flows. Then I was looking at specific types of uh, foreign direct investments. Not just all foreign direct investments, but those which cater or manufacture for exports. What were the uh, additional factors that became important to them? And there we found that wage rates, uh, I mean, uh, abundance of low cost quality and power became a very important uh, determinant for export oriented because they are completely less uh, so, if you have a group of uh, good quality, uh, uh, you know, workers, but uh, uh, affordable, uh, low cost, then that, that was certainly an important uh, uh, driver. The access to markets to preferential arrangements also came out very significantly. So, uh, you know, countries which had a, a preferential access to certain countries, Say, for instance, in, under Lomé Convention, some countries get uh, preferential access to European countries' markets. So they uh, you know, uh, become more attractive for that reason. Uh, preferential access means uh, duty free access to uh, European countries' markets. So that, becomes, uh, uh, that turned out to be very important. And then I was looking at another set of, uh, or another type of and their returns, and these were high tech and RD investments. So, uh, which countries were more attractive for uh, high technology investments by the national countries, and which were getting more RD investments? And there, few more additional factors uh, came out to be important, which were, uh, you know, for instance, the national RD or innovation activity and centers of excellence. And it's not an accident that Bangalore became India's IT hub because there was an Indian Institute of Science and many other uh, centers of excellence there. So these attract uh, the other companies, knowledge-based uh, industries and uh, R&D investments. So, uh, so that was a very important uh, issue. Agglomeration economies also are very important determinants of high technology or knowledge service industries, uh, FDI. Uh, you know, agglomeration is again a clustering. You see the pattern of clustering in high tech industries, Silicon Valley or India's uh, Bangalore, and uh, you know, Pune is becoming also one of the uh, important clusters of certain industries, whether it is automotive or in educational institutions. So, and in the light of these uh, determinants, what are India's key advantages for technical API? And one of the biggest advantages or effectiveness for both India or API is obviously it's a very large and fast growing game behind in changing the the slides for, for you. So, uh, one of the biggest uh, advantages India offers is very large and very fast growing market. And that is uh, in the previous slide I was showing you, uh, that is the biggest attraction of FDI for FDI. Multinational companies do not go, want to go to anywhere, they want to go to 
places where they have you know people wanting to consume their products so obviously market uh, availability of your uh, market becomes a very important driver or attraction and uh, india has that and currently it's one of the fastest growing economies one of the fastest growing major economies anywhere in the world and so this is something uh, which certainly makes india a very attractive destination for fdi another very distinguishing character, character or, or uh, you know sort of uh, advantage of india is that its economy is driven by domestic consumption and investment unlike some economies which are driven by export orientation or using other country demand rather than their own china is very important example which uh, is one country where uh, you know uh, share of uh, domestic consumption is less than 50% you know and uh, in, in in gdp and uh, so it is driven uh, by investment and external demand so it has been growing over time uh, by exporting exporting and making for everyone and now it's uh, slowing down the economy is slowing down relatively because the world demand and world trade has started to slow down after the onset of the global financial crisis pool of talent and manpower which is also really cheap uh, and low cost uh, is another step india is uh, by far uh, the most uh, attractive global hub for services sector there is this at kiri company which is a global consultancy company which every year does this uh, uh, location uh, for services index attractiveness uh, index and india has been occupying the first place in that index or, or ranking of countries across the world for services attractiveness and ever since 2004 when the atp company started that index a vibrant pool of entrepreneurship uh, is also one of the sense the favorable demography uh, and i'm sure you are familiar about it uh, this is the youthful mass of india population which is uh, going to remain there for next 20 years for next 20 years the proportion of working age population in india's total population will continue to grow while many other countries including china uh, you know they are getting into this aging society stage where the working age population's share in total population begins to decline and uh, you know there are uh, more people uh, enjoying than producing and so some of the western economies are already in that uh, syndrome Japan is very much an aging society, and so is China. Getting into that. Or in contrast, India is a very youthful kind of uh, population, and uh, that is uh, one of its strengths. And the rise of middle class, uh, which is directly related to uh, the purchasing power, uh, you know, I was talking about earlier. Uh, is uh, a very important phenomenon and there are some projections which we have made and has have to show that by 2050 india would be the biggest center of consumption in the world you know uh, because of uh, the expanding uh, middle class and uh, uh, so the consumption uh, going in that proportion uh, it would make india as the biggest center of attention in the world so these are some of the trends now in the light of uh, the determinants the, the, the policy changes towards more liberal uh, attitude of the government the uh, the uh, determinants of fbi what drives them to a particular country and uh, in their stance now we look at how successful india has been in attracting more and more of fdi and then the, uh, look at what kind of quality of this fdi has been 
Okay, now coming to the inflows of FDI and the magnitudes of quantity, uh, they have been, of course, growing and they have responded very well to the liberalization of policy. But I must uh, caution that part of this rise that you see on the figure is uh, also a scale effect. The scale effect means that globally the magnitude of FDI has also gone up. So even if you were at the same place where you were and you did not make any policy changes, proportionately you would get more FDI because the overall global magnitude has gone up. Okay? So all of it, all of this bias cannot be attributed to just policies alone. There is also a scale effect which is changing, which is, which is FDI is an expanding phenomenon. And uh, so over time, the FBI flows to India have been growing, but the major turnaround came in 2005-06, when in one year, the annual FBI inflows, you know, tripled uh, to, to the country. And so, uh, you know, uh, that, and, and the peak of annual inflows came in 2008-9, the year in which India attracted $47 billion dollars, or plus, kind of. Then, uh, so, uh, partly, if you look at this figure, you see that the continued relevance of macro fundamentals. In the period when there is this upward sloping movement, this was also the period when Indian economy was growing at 9% plus kind of rates. Uh, 2003 to 2009, uh, you know, the, the 9% kind of growth. Afterwards, uh, a decline, a slowdown, uh, because also the global financial crisis. Then uh, it recovered uh, and uh, again slowed down. So, some, uh, you know, lag effect or some effect of uh, how the economy is performing also has something to do with the way uh, FDI and inflows are coming or dropping. Now, absolute numbers do not tell much uh, because you need to know how attractive India is vis a vis other countries. You, you know, it's not uh, just uh, attracting more FDI, but uh, whether we are becoming over time more attractive compared to, compared to other countries or not. So in that context, one needs to look at the share, and they are share in global inflows. And uh, there, you know, you see that, uh, uh, you know, it has, India's share in FBI inflows has improved. Now in the top figure, uh, on the right hand side, uh, you have three lines. The first line, the top line, uh, or, or let me begin with the bottom line, the bottom, the dark brown kind of line. Is India's share in world, uh, you know, in global FDI inflows? The second line, the middle line, blue, is India's share in developing economy, FDI going, going to developing economy. And the top line is in India's share in FDI going to uh, developing Asia. And so in all the three, you see a pattern that in 2008-9, when India's share of FBI inflow peaked, there was a top uh, share. But in, never, in, in no case, in the global, uh, you know, uh, India's share in global FBI inflows exceeded more than 2.5%. And now uh, it came down to about 2%. So it's a relatively uh, small share, and even the developing Asia, uh, it touched 12% uh, in this uh, year 2008 9 but has related, come down to 6-7% now. The other comparison can be made in terms of what is in, uh, the FBI in comparison to gross fixed capital formation, which is like investment rate. So, what proportion of investment in the economy is supported or funded by government? And there, at this bottom three, uh, the green line of FDI to 
investment for developing countries and this orange or brown line is for India. And you see that in uh, 2008 9 when FBI in, uh, in closed in India peaked, it touched uh, the proportion for developing Asia, but later on it has gone down. So what you uh, see from this is that potential of India as an uh, investment destination remains to be fully exploited. I mean, there is some where to go. Uh, the 2008 9 showed uh, what was possible. And uh, now, again, we have to get back to that moment. Now, what do you learn from uh, some global surveys in terms of uh, the FBI climate? And there are many, actually, uh, many agencies which conduct annual surveys on uh, FBI climate uh, of different countries, that the countries across the world. And one of them is APKRD, which is my favorite, because it comes out every year around the same time. Uh, every, uh, the, again, uh, yes. So uh, ATKRD uh, is a global consultancy company, as I was saying earlier. Uh, it ranks all uh, economies across the world uh, in terms of FDI confidence index. And India occupied the second uh, rank, uh, rank globally until 2012. But came down to uh, seventh place in the latest index in 2014 globally. So seventh rank globally, but within Asia, there's only one country ahead of India, which is China. And China has always been ahead of India in this thing. Then there are other such surveys conducted by JEPIC, which is Japan's uh, Bank for International Commerce or International Cooperation, Ernst and Young, which is another consultancy company, and Anka. All these three also find India's place in top three or four uh, locations. So obviously, India is occupying a lot of attention as a potential force in terms of its size of market, dynamism, and other uh, assets or advantages which uh, I was earlier talking about. But it is in very sharp contrast to uh, another survey which World Bank conducts every year, which is called Doing Business Survey. Ease of doing business uh, was the original name, now it's called doing business. And uh, according to that, this you know uh, is very sharply contrasting with the other uh, surveys which I was earlier talking about. Because according to World Bank's doing business survey, India has put a very poor uh, rank of 132 or something like that. So bottom of the list nearly. I mean, there are few countries below that, but you know, it's not, not a uh, sort of advantage or a uh, good thing to be at that kind of rank out of 190 countries, 132. Then you wonder uh, what is going on, and uh, you realize that some of the countries which occupy very high ranks in world ranks doing business surveys are the countries which are attracting nothing in terms of FDI. Some of the African countries, which were told to liberalize, liberalize, liberalize by uh, Bretton Woods institutions, and they did that, they occupy very high ranks and no FBI is going there. Very high, uh, very highly, uh, you know, uh, unattractive or very little investment at all points. And the China and India, which are the magnets of FBI globally, they both are in the very low uh, runs of the speed of doing business. China is in the upwards of 80s, so about 85, 86. And then India is further down. The one is speed of doing business, uh, you know, uh, captain. I think this uh, index is. Uh, bias against larger countries and uh, 
they will favor smaller countries. In smaller countries, smaller economies have, tend to have much lesser kind of uh, regulations, and larger economies tend to have more regulations because they are concerned about how FBI or you know, anything coming to the country would affect the local industry, local environment, you know, and all different kinds of things. And that obviously add up to layers to approval systems and all that. And that brings that down in the ego between us. So this is something which is to be kept in mind. But that said, certainly there is room for improvement in uh, you know ease of doing business in India, and that is what currently government is all the time talking about. That we want to do the investment climate, we want to make uh, things easier for investors, domestic and foreign, and uh, improve our ranking in the ease of doing business. So let us move ahead. Now coming to the quality of FBI, and that is where some of the analytical bits uh, will come. Uh, how do the FBI flows uh, have you know, contributed to other uh, to development in India and compared to other countries? In particular, what can be learned from sectoral composition of FBI, the entry more, the effect on growth, domestic investment, balance in development, and exports. Now, believe that the sector of composition and anti more when you look at the composition of FBI coming to India, to India, you find that uh, it is not going, the bulk of FBI is not going to manufacturing sector. It is a very large proportion going to services and uh, very small, uh, you know, 40 percent kind of uh, share is of uh, manufacturing. Compare it with what is happening in China's case. In China, the bulk of FBI goes to the manufacturing sector. It's actually pushed to the manufacturing sector, and very little is going to services. And uh, that is what has made China as a manufacturing hub of the world. So, in the context of making India, this is something one needs to look at. The other issue is entry mode. How the FBI comes in? FBI comes in and invests in new plant and machinery. That adds to the uh, technological capability uh, or manufacturing uh, capability of the country, or it acquires the existing running companies. And again, you find a very stark difference between India and China. In India, a very substantial proportion, I uh, computed recently, 45% uh, of FBI takes the form of acquisition of existing companies which is virtually nil in China's case. In China's case, almost all of FBI is by way of greenfield, setting up new companies, new plants, new machinery, you know, a new manufacturing basis. Uh, so this is uh, another way of looking at the quality of FBI, how much additional investment takes place out of FBI. Sorry. Uh, growth, impact on growth and uh, domestic investment. You know that uh, I was earlier talking about growth prospects of the economy becoming uh, uh, a, a, one of the drivers or one of the determinants of foreign direct investment. And FDI coming into the country could be driving growth as well. So there is a two way relationship. Growth or dynamism of the economy could be affecting more FDI. And FDI could also be contributing to growth. So you have a simultaneity bias. I mean, you need to disentangle the effects of FDI to growth and growth to FDI. When you do uh, that, when you correct for direction of causality, as they did in a study of 101 countries that I did some, some years ago. We found that the effect of FBI on growth in India was not pronounced, or in the economic terms, it was grander neutral. I mean, you could not say uh, growth leads to FBI or FBI leads to growth. So, uh, so it was a kind of mixed picture coming out that none of the neither growth to FBI nor FBI to growth effect was pronounced, and that is why it is grander neutral. But Check the same relationship for China and other East Asian countries. 
you find a very pronounced FBIQ growth effect. Then FBIQ and it fosters growth. So, uh, so this day, I mean, the quality of FBI can increase there, and that that going to China and Japan is different. It looks different. The other thing we were checking was the effect of FBI on domestic investments. Again, they can be complicated, very complex kind of relationship between FBI and domestic investments. Let me give you an example to clarify this. You have a soft, uh, soft drinks industry, and supposing there was no Coca Cola, and there was a situation, you know, uh, for many years there was no Coca Cola company in India. Suddenly, Coca Cola comes, which has its huge uh, goodwill for its brand name, globally known brand name, Coca Cola. It could be driving any domestic players out of competition. Yeah. So, it, so that would be one kind of effect on domestic investments. That domestic investments are crowded out because of very superior assets uh, commanded by foreign investors. So this could be one kind of uh, possibility. Another possibility could be that a foreign investor comes, so multinational company sets up a car plant for instance. They begin an assembly a car and they buy inputs from uh, local vendors and so local vendors may be investing more to feed into the demand created by this new company and so they may be crowding in more domestic investments so which of these two effects whether FBI coming in the country was crowding in more investments or was crowding out more uh, domestic investments which of these effects are, uh, was uh, you know uh, more pronounced. And again, we were trying to check it up in a dynamic context uh, because it cannot be measured in one year. Uh, you know, FBI coming in, uh, whether it is driving uh, out the domestic competition or crowding in more domestic investment would be happening over a period of time. You know, so the car company begins assembling uh, cars, they begin to gradually develop vendors locally. And domestic investment may be following up over uh, the next five years or ten years. Similarly, uh, driving out competition could not be happening in one year. I mean, in the first year that Coca Cola establishes itself, uh, you may have some competition. So the local companies lose business, say, to 50% of their market. Next year, another 25%. Uh, so in three, four years, you may be like, so it is a dynamic situation that uh, this effect uh, it should be captured over time. So in a dynamic setting, when we were checking the impact of FBI on domestic investments, for India, there was no statistically significant effect. You know, there was a lag kind of model uh, in, to capture the dynamic situation. So there was no statistically significant effect on domestic investment. How do you interpret that? That some investments were crowding in more investment, uh, more domestic investment. Some foreign direct investments were driving out domestic investment. So overall pattern, there was no pronounced pattern dominating. And that's why the statistically insignificant relationship you find. But again, for some countries in East Asia, China, uh, there was a very pronounced significant effect of FBI on uh, domestic investment. So FBI was coming in, it was driving in more for life, more domestic investment. And then we begin to look at why there is a systematic difference uh, between India and East Asian countries. And there you will find that government policy's role was very significant because in the East Asian economies they were very conscious of pushing FBI in such a manner that it contributes to building up of local capacities it brings in more knowledge and it uh, contributes and complements domestic investments rather than driving them out and they achieved those objectives sometimes through selective uh, policies to investors, 
sometimes through performance requirements. Just to give you an example of uh, Thailand. Thailand uh, in 1960s and 70s decided to become a hub of automotive industry. And they invited Toyota and Honda to set up manufacturing bases. And obviously, the tendency of a foreign company, a multinational company, when it invests in a foreign location, is to just assemble, you know, just assemble shallow uh, kind of manufacturing. You bring all the components from everywhere and assemble the car and uh, convince the whole government that we are doing something. <laughs> but uh, Thai government was very smart. They imposed local content requirements on, on this, these two companies. That forced these companies to produce components also locally. They brought their own vendors from Japan and they set up the manufacturing bases and gradually the cars were locally made. Then they realized that they are all selling their cars in the domestic market. We need to use these capacities that they have built to export, to become export platforms. And, uh, you know, so they pushed the, uh, these companies through export performance organizations or export performance requirements to export them. Now, Thailand over time became a backdrop of location. You know, it is a very solid base of both Honda and Toyota. And it used uh, millions of cars for export to uh, the regional markets. And so, so some of these kind of policies uh, have helped in crowding in of uh, FBI, crowding in more of the signal and contributing more positively to growth than uh, in India where it is a mixed back kind of picture which emerges. Now, how can, how uh, the FBI could have contributed to balanced regional development? Balanced regional development means, uh, you know, there are states uh, which are backward, relatively poor in terms of uh, income and growth and the poverty levels. There are others which are more advanced. And whether FBI could be helping to bridge this gap, closing this development gap in richer segments or, or locations or regions in the country and in poorer ones. Now, if you look at the pattern of FBI, where they are going, once they come to India, where they are setting up their manufacturing bases, and again, uh, I was involved in a study uh, which was looking at the patterns and their determinants. We find that location of FBI in India was determined by the state per capita income, that means levels of income or fertility power, like in the inter-country context, level of urbanization, infrastructure availability, financial leakages of uh, availability of finance, you know, the financial institutions, the bank branches and all that, and level of industrialization. So, uh, so in other words, uh, I, the FBI seems to be perpetuating the, income in, uh, the uh, regional inequalities rather than narrowing them. So they were going to places which were already ahead, which had better incomes, better levels of urbanization, better infrastructure, and uh, higher level of internationalization. Say, for instance, Gujarat state or Maharashtra state or southern India. And that is where most of the FBI would go, rather than to states like Odisha or UP or Bihar, where more investments are needed. So, and similarly for China, in this respect, is no different. There also, FBI has gone to places where um, already more development has taken place. And uh, so, you do not expect FBI to contribute to, uh, FBI to, contribute to uh, bridging or narrowing the development gaps between your regions. And this is a role which is to be played by governments by creating infrastructure in the lagging regions, which attracts FBI. You know, infrastructure is a big pool. Infrastructure development uh, helps to attract FBI. And so, uh, government has to be uh, 
by creating infrastructure development uh, uh, and that way attracting more domestic and foreign workers. So this is something we cannot do to uh, the uh, uh, FBI. FBI and export platform production. This is a very important uh, aspect of quality which you know uh, FBI is expected to perform because you know that FBI have uh, the foreign investors or multinational companies have uh, access to their own captive ma uh, marketing networks. They have the strong brand names which are recognized globally. So if they run they can set up export platform bases in the country and not only they bring technology, generate jobs, create output, but also exports. So what is the uh, pattern uh, in that respect? And again, you are familiar with how China became a factory of uh, Asia and the world. And how did it happen? Very largely dependent upon FBI. In fact, 55% uh, of all manufactured exports of China are undertaken by foreign companies. And 80% of technology intensive exports are undertaken by foreign companies from China. So uh, the China manufacturing hub is largely foreign company uh, contributed hub. And in that process, it has created millions of jobs and made it a global factory. The advantage of export oriented or export platform uh, FBI is that it brings best practice technology because if you are in the exporting business, you have to be on top of the uh, range. You can't be uh, using outdated technology. So they will necessarily bring uh, most up to date technology. They will, uh, you know, crowd in more domestic investment uh, because if they are exporting, they will have to have bases around themselves and uh, technology and information externalities for domestic firms could be very substantial. And that is how actually a lot of companies in China and in other countries have learned uh, by see how these were setting up because this is an exporting to where and what. So they also followed that. So they were substantial learning by other companies uh, from these export platform events. In India's case, FBI on the other hand is largely coming to tap the domestic market. And very few uh, you know, export platform investments have been made in the country. There are some, of course, Hyundai for instance, so it's, uh, making cars in India, not only for India, but also for exporting from here. And uh, uh, there are a number of other country, uh, companies which have uh, set up export platform places. But this, in this direction, India is yet to achieve its potential. I think this is one area where we need to push FBI for developing export bases in the country. And it is it, 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 the success of China and Thailand in this respect is actually uh, one lesson which comes out very strongly is that they have used uh, performance requirements very sensibly. And uh, some of, sometimes similar performance requirements have also delivered in India. I can give you an example of auto parts industry, auto components industry. You know, India used to impose a, a regulation on uh, or a requirement on foreign companies coming to India until 2000, which was called foreign exchange neutrality. Like a company which comes to India, if it imports something and it spends foreign exchange, has to earn as much foreign exchange to make the country foreign exchange neutral. You know, that there is no loss. So Ford Motor Car Company, when it entered India in 1997, it was imposed something like that, a change in quality. It was in some time period, nobody paid any attention to it. And this company started uh, setting up an assembly plant, they started to produce cars. Then when they were again in the Ministry of Industry in New York, Holland, somebody reminded them, what happened to your foreign exchange in quality clause that you imposed on your uh, tool? And they were, you know, uh, 
change their life. They have not paid any attention to that. And they suddenly realize that they have something, some obligation to fulfill. And they started to wonder how they can fulfill this commitment because uh, after all it was an assembly plan. And the assembly plan depended upon imported components coming from all over. And so there was a lot of foreign exchange output. That means they had to export as much to utilize uh, the foreign exchange uh, uses by them. So, okay, they, they began to look into what could be done. So they invited some uh, engineers from their England uh, affiliate. And uh, they sent some people from Vision. Vision is a subsidiary of Ford which looks after their component fields. These Vision people came to India, they, uh, you know, sort of uh, procured some samples of components from Chennai and other places and exported them to the uh, inlet plant. When these shipments arrived, uh, when these containments arrived in England, and they opened them, so, and somebody who I interviewed about this uh, said that they were astonished to find the good quality component, but very cheap uh, in terms of cost, so very competitive uh, prices. Then they realized what a gold mine we are uh, you know, ignoring, we are not looking into. It. So they sent a big team to India to procure and procure more and procure. And then they came back to set up two subsidiaries just to procure, procure, procure. So they set up a flourishing business of auto components procuring for India. That attracted attention of uh, General Motors, which is, as you know, like Coca Cola and Pepsi, is an arch rival of uh, Ford. And they uh, sent a mission to find out what Ford was doing, what, how Ford was making money in India. And they realized that they were procuring components of good quality at competitive prices. They sent them to the Delphi Systems, which is a component uh, subsidiary of General Motors. And they began procuring from India. Then came Volvo. Then came, you know, uh, all, one after the other, all different uh, auto companies from anywhere in the world are now procuring components from India. And you can see the trade statistics, you will find that in, until 2000, there was not a single dollar of component export from India, today 20 billion dollars per year of component exports. So this is what can happen by nudging the foreign investors into doing something. And this is what the foreign exchange neutrality performance requirement achieved. And so, so sometimes, these kind of requirements uh, can be very helpful. My time is, uh, uh, is up, so I must be winding up. And so this is, I think, yeah, this is the last slide. So uh, just to conclude, I think India has been uh, attracting rising magnitudes of FBI, but they have been of mixed quality. And certainly, uh, the quality needs to be improved in terms of their development contribution uh, to, to India, India's growth story, and uh, in particular in the context of unique in India, FBI can be a very substantial contribution if, uh, you know, the, the certain uh, policy tweaking is done. And in particular, leveraging India's attractiveness of large market, you know, the large market, dynamic market, uh, so all that can be uh, used to good effect to attract right kind of investments, pushing them in the right kind of directions so that they contribute more to India's development and aspirations, including through export-oriented or export substituting activities, which uh, have greater potential to contribute uh, in terms of technology flows, uh, crowding in, and uh, you know, rather than crowding out on the city. And in that respect, proactive targeting of foreign direct investment sometimes can be a very useful tool uh, for getting right kind of investments. And just to give you one uh, example to clarify how uh, uh, you know, the proactive uh, targeting works. In 1982, when the government of India wanted to set up a small car plant, to use a cheap small car, car in volumes, greater volumes, 
to sell to uh, people who wanted to buy cars. Uh, they had this concept of a uh, you know, small car, Maluti. So they developed the parameters of the project that we will produce to begin with 100,000 cars per year. This will be of this size and uh, within five years, 75% of the cars will be made in India rather than just assembled. Okay? And the government will provide land, government will provide all these facilities and then invited bits. And so several companies were at the doorstep of India and uh, Suzuki uh, was eventually selected. And uh, because it was invited, it was attracted on its own terms. That's in this thing. Today, uh, Suzuki is the largest car producer, produces uh, you know, millions of cars, and they are all produced in India, except for very few components that still come from the hand. And so, so uh, and it has led to development of the huge component industry. So, uh, so such things, proactive targeting is a good policy. Performance requirements is another policy to improve quality I have just explained earlier. And then uh, some supplementary policies to absorb the, uh, knowledge from what is coming. Uh, and diffusion also is very important. And in that respect, pioneer industry development programs, some countries like Malaysia use pioneer industry development programs, some countries have leakage programs, leakage with local firms, encouraging joint ventures can also be helpful. So all these uh, are some of the uh, different types of policies that have been used by different countries to increase the value FBI can bring to the country and the development uh, of the host country. So that's where I will stop. Uh, I'm sure you have uh, many uh, questions or clarifications in your mind and uh, I would be very happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the enlightening speech. Uh, we now open with the question and answer round. If you have a question, please raise your hand and one of our volunteers will pass on the mic to you. Uh, quite an interesting overview. I have two basic uh, I mean, things to understand from, of course, what is the take home message? Mota Moti, aap jo kahe rahe hain, I hope you follow some Hindi. Ek to ek sari jok ki hai, Amreji ne sada mein parbaat kar diya. Yeh chal nahi raha hai, chal raha hai? Chal raha hai, waise hi bol rahi hai. Ek to aap do Mota Moti baate kahe rahe hain, ek itna sab, जो नॉइज है एफडीआई का उसके बावजूद जो भारत में एफडीआई आता है वो मात्र दो परसेंट है टोटली टू परसेंट ऑफ टोटल दैट फॉरेन इन्वेस्टमेंट दूसरी बात आप जो कह रहे हैं कि आखिर ये भारत के राष्ट्रीय आय से हाउ मच इट इज ऑफ इंडिया जीडी एंड इट अगेन इज टू परसेंट तो ये सारा जो मामला चल रहा है और आपका पॉलिसी पॉलिसी लेसन जिसको आप बोल रहे हैं मुझे तो उसमें बहुत गड़बड़ नजर आती है और मैं ऐसा बोलना चाहिए क्योंकि विद्यार्थियों को समझना चाहिए हम जो मिडिल क्लास यहाँ बैठा है जिसको हमारा काम पता नहीं हमारे शहर में गरीब लोग कहा रहे तो पता नहीं लेकिन हमें विदेश सारा पता है तो इन लोगों के लिए मैं कुछ बात करना चाहता हूँ और सवाल लेना चाहता एक तो दूसरी बात आप बताइए क्राउडिंग इन क्राउडिंग आउट बड़े अच्छे अंग्रेजी शब्द है लेकिन माने क्या है कितना कैपिटल आउटफ्लो फ्लाइट ऑफ द कैपिटल फ्रॉम इंडिया ड्यूरिंग द लास्ट सो मेनी इयर्स एंड आफ्टर नाइनटीन नाइनटी वन डू यू हैव एनी नंबर ऑन दैट एंड सेकेंड इवन द फैक्ट दैट हाफ ऑफ द इंडिया इकोनॉमी इज अ पैरल इकोनॉमी ब्लैक इकोनॉमी एंड अकाउंटेड इकोनॉमी वट एवर इट इज वॉट इज द मैसेज दैट यू आर गोइंग Giving from this, and third and final point, 
ऑफ ऑल मेड इन इंडिया भारत में बनाओ इसका मतलब भारत भारत में प्रदूषण करो मेक पोल्यूशन इन इंडिया आई थिंक ऑन विच होल प्रेजेंटेशन इज बेस्ट बट देख रहे हैं और सवाल क्या कर रहे हैं मुझे ये पूछना है कि ये अगर सब है तो ये ऑटोमोबाइल इंडस्ट्री मुझे लगता है ऑटोमोबाइल इंडस्ट्री इज एनी नंबर वन ऑफ ह्यूमन काइंड टू डे एनी लाइसेंस टू ऑटोमोबाइल इंडस्ट्री इन इंडिया इज अ लाइसेंस टू सेव द कंट्री तो ये देश पे बेचने का सारा सारा जो मामला हो रहा है एंड इफ इट इज ओनली टू परसेंट वाई इज दैट ऑल यूर पॉलिसी डूइंग बिजनेस डूइंग इज ऑफ बिजनेस फ्रेंडली सारी इकोलॉजी की बर्बादी कर कर किसकी रोटियां आप सेक रहे हैं हम मध्यम वर्ग को यह समझना चाहिए ना हम अपने देश की भाषा बोलते हैं ना अपने देश का भोजन खाते हैं ना अपने देश का विचार करते हैं तो ये अर्थिया अर्थिया है किस बंदर का नाम है पेट्रोलियम प्रोडक्ट इंडिया इज इम्पोर्टिंग हिस्सो राइट इंडिया इज इम्पोर्टिंग वन फोर अभी ये ऑयल का दाम की वजह से कुछ ये हंड्रेड ट्रिलियन डॉलर से कुछ कम हो गया है बट इन आई अगेंज दैट वी आर एक्सपोर्टिंग द बेसिक फ्रॉम इंडिया द फूड द पल्स है द सोयाबीन एंड रॉन्ग काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स एट वी आर प्रोड्यूसिंग सो वॉट काइंड ऑफ अनर्थ शास्त्र वी वॉन्ट टू सेल इन द नेम ऑफ Any more questions? It has been proposed in this budget that uh, government of India will do a very foreign institutional investment and foreign direct investment. Uh, what kind of uh, changes do you envisage because of this move? Uh, uh, is this a uh, is this uh, any kind of dispersion? Because last year there was a uh, large foreign institutional investment in India because bankers in India were very really high uh, and uh, foreign direct investment, if compared to foreign institutional investment, was really low. So if they will do away with this, uh, what kind of picture uh, we might see? Sorry, I think we will see the last one. If we will do away with this, uh, I mean. This foreign institutional investment and foreign direct investment, and we will consider it together. What kind of uh, picture we have decided to draw? Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, you mentioned that uh, in your presentation that when you talk about MBI coming into a country, you don't you can't specifically for India, you can't determine whether it's crowding in or crowding out domestic investment. So, as a policy maker, considering that FBI has been encouraging the country right now, what are the signals that you think would indicate that FBI is crowding out investment, domestic specifically, as a policy maker? Yeah. Do we have more questions? Okay, Sali, who is over here? Yes. Uh, let me begin in the reverse order because your question is very fundamental kind of, uh, so I'll come to that. Uh, first of all, uh, the last question about uh, how do you uh, determine uh, crowding, uh, whether the investment will be crowding in or crowding out domestic investments. I think very simply, you see uh, the, the investments that are, for instance. Uh, Substituting imports or uh, you know uh, 
export platform investments. Generally, lead to more investments, more domestic investments also taking place. So, if you are already, I mean, uh, pushing FBI in these directions, you are increasing the chances of crowding in. Rather than allowing FBI to go into these sectors where already there is a local presence, local manufacturing taking place, and there it will tend to crowd out the existing you know, investment. So those chances or probability increases. So when you are deciding or, or if you are uh, you know, having the selective FBI policy, then pushing that, pushing FBI into export oriented, that you manufacture for export, do not crash into the local market. Or you substitute what we were importing. That means you are increasing the chances of crowding in and making sure that FBI contributes more positively for uh, to, to the development, creation of uh, new uh, productive sector. The question about uh, FBI FII in this budget, you know, this is about a, a regulation that for institutional investors cannot be more than a certain proportion of, uh, a, you know, a, a ownership, uh, more than 20%, for instance, because, uh, you know, these foreign institutional investments are of a speculative type, okay? Uh, they are short-term, uh, you know, investments made for capital gains or some uh, speculation rather than for longer-term, uh, you know, uh, ownership and management control. So, uh, these uh, investments, uh, there is a limit to which a company can have, okay? Otherwise, there can be a situation that uh, a company is uh, very highly uh, owned by the foreign institutional investors and they may decide to pull out someday and the company may, may be rendered, you know, very handicapped. So, uh, so that's why uh, the city and government of India have imposed a limit. Now, there is a simplification made in the budget that for uh, the uh, limit on FII, FBI and FII will be uh, used together. So you can, I mean, they were, uh, ideally you would have a certain quota or uh, percentage for FII and some for FBI. Now you can treat them together. So this is just a simplification and uh, it's not something uh, major. Now coming to your question, sir, I think you are raising a very fundamental uh, kind of question, which is, uh, you know, either you are uh, content with the economy that we inherited in 1947, okay? A uh, rural oriented economy, which is dealing from the rest of the world, then of course it has an own ecosystem and equilibrium. You know, uh, then you are not opening up your uh, borders to foreign investment. But if you do open, then you have to be competitive. You have to be producing something. You know that. So this is just two types of economic systems. And uh, if you uh, have opened up, so that decision was taken in 1947 or 50. You know, when you have taken that decision, then there is no going back. Then you cannot say that I want export, I won't let anybody in, I mean, I won't let you produce, I want not export. You know, uh, so uh, this is a foregone conclusion. Now it is, we don't have that option. Either you go back to that rural economy kind of syndrome and we live ever happy, happily ever again, you know. But uh, once we have decided uh, to move in certain direction, then all these things you have to. And so what we are trying to do or trying to talk about is that when you have opened your doors, when you have decided to build industry and manufacturing and all that, how you can make or draw better value, you know, get more value from foreign direct investments. You see, you have opened the doors to foreign direct investments. Now, what I was trying to address is how you can make FBI work more for you, for uh, India. And how we can, uh, rather than potato chips kind of FBI, uh, how you can make them uh, make things which we want or and we are importing from abroad. 
you know, paying a uh, huge uh, amount of uh, foreign exchange. So, and in that process, creating more value addition, more jobs, and uh, saving for it. So, this is the two types of two different types of uh, economies we are talking. And there is no overlap between them. So, either uh, you know, the Bhutan has for instance decided that they want to remain a traditional economy and they uh, count uh, GDP in that for happiness. Very fine. It is people's choice. But uh, going in the other direction, now we can't say that all oh, this is bad. Yes. So, Nagesh <laughs> Kumar ji. No, no, Nagesh no. Kumar ji. The simple point that I'm reading. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, eight, eight minutes. Yeah, isko samajhna chahiye na, to yeah, tie laga ki kuch nahi ho. Thank you. Samajh jaye. Tie laga ki se kya ho, kandar ban jaye. So, okay. So, main ye keh raha hoon ki, India's economy today is a two trillion dollar economy. Agree? Yes. India's economy today is a two trillion dollar economy. Yes. And the F, the best of the FDI that we received is a forty five billion. That means two percent again. Yes. Why are we so much obsessed? Nobody is obsessed. No, no. And <laughs> the, the argument that you are making, yes. you forget everything. And what are you bartering it with? You are bartering it with the. You see, you brought the whole automobile industry to the India, India, and this middle class, everybody wants the car. But cost of the car is earned by Fred Nagesh Kumar. Car, cost of the car. This bala motor gadi ki kimmat. ये वसुंधरा है इसको खत्म कर कर गाड़ी चिकना लोग चलाना चाहते हैं मुझे बताइए है स्टिल यू वुड यू हैव अ चॉइस दैट यू वांट टू बर्न आई 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 थिंक आई हैव आंसर्ड योर नहीं आई विल एग्री टू दिस आई डोंट सेट नहीं आई विल एग्री हम विकंड बात नहीं कर रहे हैं संवाद कर रहे हैं ये अनर्थ का शास्त्र जो अर्थशास्त्र बना दिया है and we are resource illiterate people and we are perpetuating resource illiteracy and making them all food and we become food uh, yes. we want to please come back for a big debate about this yes. please come back yes. another day yeah. yeah. have a big debate about this issue yes. 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 no first of all first of all yeah no 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 let, let me let me talk with you no no
I request the audience to stay back. We'll begin with the next session shortly. Uh, we we'll start with the session immediately and we we'll have a tea break after uh, the following session. <laughs> Everyone, please settle down. Please settle down. We'll be starting with the session immediately. Please settle down. A very good evening to one and all. A warm welcome to today's last session. The topic of discussion is WTO and food security issues and challenges. India's stand at the WTO on food security is a pertinent issue, and the overall dynamics affects our economy in a particularly crucial manner. At this juncture, the importance of global trade facilitation cannot be ignored. For this session, we have amongst us Dr. Sachin Kumar Sharma. He is an assistant professor at the Center for WTO Studies, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, New Delhi. He has a PhD in economics from JNU, titled Rationalization of Input Subsidy under Trade Liberalization, a case study of Haryana Agriculture. He also has an MPhil from JNU in economics titled WTO and Haryana Agriculture. He is a recipient of the UGC Junior Research Fellowship. Before joining the CWS, he has worked as a consultant with the UNDP and the Planning Commission on the National Human Development Report. He has also worked as a research fellow on a project funded by the Afro-Asian Rural Development Organization and as a coordinator and contributor at the Indian Council of Social Science Research, New Delhi. He has presented numerous papers at various national and international conferences, including that at the Thomas Hart University, Bangkok, and at the ArtNet workshop 2013 in Macau, China. I would now like to invite her on the stage. Hello, everyone. It's very nice, nice campus, this local institute. It's my first visit to this institute. And I just remember the Shanti Niketan when I visited the Shanti Niketan, the like most people are the same like this.
the students today i am going to discuss uh, about wt and food security issue and challenges this topic very controversial for the last one and a half year and this uh, this food security is also in news for the long time at least for the last one and a half and two years where indian media and western media have criticized india as a laughing stock and uh, they also blamed india that uh, due to india wto will be doomed and the multilateral negotiation will be totally doomed due to the india stand on food security today i am going to discuss what what is the problem related to food security issue what is the india stand why other country has criticized india on that issue and what is the future stand but the stand india government had taken for the wto negotiation before that i start about wto and uh, food security i just start the fundamental question see what is this is the wto negotiation of food security all all people do negotiation uh, son do negotiation with father boy boyfriend do negotiation with girlfriend uh, Girlfriend, but this is a social negotiation. Just to make it, when you do the trade negotiation, when you do the trade negotiation, there are just a simple example. When you go to the market and buy some fruits from the market, and in the if the vendor asks you hundred rupees per kg for apple, then you always negotiate that no, we will give only sixty rupees. that time you never think about the status of that vendor you don't think that this person is poor you should give more it's never never come in our mind because why because we always do profit maximization similarly if you extend this logic to the multilateral level this is a hard core trade negotiation hard core trade negotiation even in developed country give assurance that you will give special and differential treatment to the developing country but practically they never do this why is this wto and food security very sensitive issue the background is this how this agreement on agriculture agreement on agriculture is a part of wto how this agreement on agriculture came into existence it was a trade war between eu and us it was a trade war between eu and us because that time after second world war this country had given huge subsidies to the agriculture sector due to this the international prices of agriculture commodity were down many developing countries complained about this thing as well as the australia new zealand and many ngos also raised this issue due to this trade war between us and eu there was an accord we called it blair house accord in 1993 in this accord usa eu they did negotiation on the agriculture and many other developing country they also signed that agreement and this agreement was extended to wto now when the two parties are doing the negotiation then those provisions should be It would be according to the socio-economic situation prevailing in US or EU rather than in developing countries. When India signed WTO and the agreement on agriculture, what was our expectation? As a policy maker, what was our expectation? Our expectation was very simple: that once this agreement on agriculture came into existence, come into the implementation. then developed country would reduce subsidies once they reduce subsidies the production in developed country go down once the production go down the international prices of agriculture commodity go up and then developing country as a natural competitive advantage they will able to export in the international market and then farmers in this developing country will benefit this is a simple logic when indian policy maker 1995 signed but after 1995 things had totally changed 
Rather than reducing the subsidies, developed countries have given more subsidies. They have exploited the loopholes in the agreement on agriculture. On the other hand, developing countries are facing more problems, even in implementing their food security policy. In the past, in 1995, when we talk about the negotiation in the Uruguay round, developing countries have not been very active in the negotiation. If you read this statement by Pascal Lamy in the negotiation, what is written? That in the old days, getting a new round launched and indeed agreed by the simple equation of aligning US and EU interests. That was a simple. And it was true that developing country not raised those issues in 1995. But after 1995, developing country themselves they are facing problems in providing subsidies or implementing food security policy or implementing domestic support to the millions of farmers. So the developing country start raising this issue. And India then took stand on food security. And, and there was much ado about stand taken by India. Western media criticized India's stand, even Indian intellectual and Indian media also criticized India's stand on food security. And there's a lot of misinformation also going on about India's stand on food security. It would be good if we hear that in misinformation. I will just put forward some facts on the food security. Then you have to think whether India stand was right or wrong. Or whether developed country has the flexibility, more flexibility in WTO negotiation or developing country. Whether developing country are demanding the right thing or wrong thing. That you have to decide. I am just putting forward the facts and what why India has taken the step. And even one more thing, in the negotiation. See, this is a very hardcore negotiation. Even if you want to change a simple word or simple sentence, it's very hard to change. And when India demanded something on the food security, then Western media, US, EU, and many other developed countries, even Australia and New Zealand, they criticized. They told that this WTO would do due to India's stand on food security. See, when I joined this center, the WTO in 2009, that time Professor Bhagavati came in 2009 in city. Even that time, India took stand on a different issue called SSM, Special Safeguard Layer. That time, also these pressure tactics were followed. But India, that time, also took strong stand on the issue because they, India wanted to protect the interest of the farmers. It's not about India's farmers, most of the developing countries' farm. So India took the stand and in the negotiation India was single out. It was said that it's only India's problem, but no, it was not India's problem. It was the problem of most of the developing countries. And this I will just try to prove this thing. <laughs> now before I start uh, further, just one, one question, one question I want to clear this. What is agriculture in international trade? You, you are students of agriculture business. What is agriculture in international trade? That's a very important point. Because the, what I'm going to discuss, the provisions are applicable only on the agriculture, not the manufacturing. See, when we are talking about the international trade, agriculture is defined on the basis of harmonized system of product classification. Have you heard about HS code, friends? This is the HS code, it's a nomenclature where we give code to each and every product. Whether it's the mic, pen, paper, anything, the shirt, pen, you have, you are wearing. This specific code, there is specific code when you are talking about international trade. We talk about international trade in terms of HS code. So in the WTO, there are few HS code, there are few chapters, I'm not going further on that. Some lines are defined on the basis of, on that basis the agriculture is defined. 
Beside those lines, all other lines are manufacturing or low market agriculture access. So, as this is a basic information, you should remember that. What is agriculture in international trade may be different from what you are reading in your textbook. In international trade, agriculture is defined on the basis of HS classification. You have to read that HS classification. Now, for example, whether rubber is an agriculture product or not. Yes or no? Rubber is not an agriculture product. Fishery is an agriculture product or not? Fishery is not an agriculture product in international trade. This is, this is the definition of agriculture sector in the international trade. When we talk about export, import, when we talk about export subsidies or subsidies issue, agriculture, when we talk about, it should be based on this definition. This is the WTO definition and because all international trade now won by WTO, so this definition is applicable. Now food security. See, food security is very sensitive issue, very, very sensitive issue in the Doha negotiation. In the recent negotiation, developed country raised this issue that India raised this issue only two years back. No, India raised this issue in 90, 2000. First proposal India made in 2000, even before Doha. Even before Doha. After that, uh, African group also raised this issue on the food scale. So this issue is long back. It's not uh, that we raised only two years back. It's a very old issue. Now, this Doha negotiation was started in 2001. When we started the negotiation, the main objective was to reduce or ask the developed country to reduce their subsidies. Till 2001 to 2010, we were raising this issue. But after 2010, now developed countries are telling us that we are distorting international trade. Due to our policy, our agriculture policy, we are distorting agriculture trade and we also the cause for the suffering of the LDC country or African groups. These are also blamed by some of the developed countries. So, then, why India raised Because we are finding this problem in implementing food security policy. One more point, the basic point I want to clear and then after that I'll start my presentation. Have you heard about amber box and green box? See, in WTO, there are three boxes, amber box, blue box and green box. Amber box has two parts. Amber box has two parts product specific and rural product specific. In case of India, we are giving product specific score in terms of minimum score price policy. We are giving score in terms of minimum score price policy. In non product specific score, we are giving fertilizer subsidies, we are giving canal subsidies, we are also giving power subsidies and credit subsidies. That is non product specific. Why is non product specific? Because Government gives subsidies to the farmers. Now it's choice. It's depending on the farmers, but product or what crop they cultivate. It's your choice. Whereas product specific is specific to a crop, like minimum score price for wheat, minimum score price for rice, minimum score price for other 24 crops. So this is the difference between product specific and non-product specific. Now in product specific, a developing country like India can give score only up to 10%, please note down, only 10% of value of specific product. 10% of value of specific product. For wheat, we can give 10% of value of wheat of that year. For rice, value of rice for that year, 10%. In case of non product specific, we can give subsidies only up to 10% of total value of agriculture production. It means agriculture GDP. We can give subsidies up to 10% of agriculture GDP, non-product specific. 
Now, if you see the India's data on fertilizer, canal irrigation, power subsidies, India's India's subsidies as a percentage of GDP is more than 10 percent. So why the other countries are not taking India to the dispute? It is because we have one special provision. We have one special provision. What is the special provision? That if a developing country, if a developing country gives subsidy to a farmer who is a low income poor resource poor, if Indian government gives subsidies to a farmer who is low income or resource poor farmer, then India is free to give that subsidy. There is no limitation. I am just repeating again. If a developing country gives subsidies to low income or resource poor farmer, then there is no limit. India can give that input subsidies without any limit. Now, question comes. Who are low income or resource poor farmer in India? Who are low income or resource poor farmer in India? Any guess? See, in India we have defined low income or resource poor farmer on the basis of land holding. On the basis of land holding. If a farmer, if a farmer has land holding up to 10 hectares, I am repeating, if a land farmer has land holding up to 10 hectares, then we categorize that farmer as low income or resource poor farmer. This definition we have adopted in WTO. Now, if we have taken this definition, there are 99.2% farmers are low income or resource poor. So in WTO, we have defined our 99.2% of farmers as low income or resource poor. What is the benefit that government can give subsidies without any limit? So if you read in the newspaper that due to WTO, government is reducing fertilizer subsidies, credit subsidies, power subsidies, then it's totally wrong. You have that flexibility under WTO. You can give that subsidies to the farmer without any limit. And this is the article 6.2 of agreement on any. So you have enough flexibility to give input subsidies to the agriculture. Now, then what is the problem? See, we have problem in product specific score. We have problem in product specific score. What is the problem in the product specific score? That in India we are giving product specific score in terms of minimum score price policy. And how minimum score price policy is interlinked with food security? See, minimum score price policy is linked with food security. How? In India, government announced minimum score price for 24 crops. Then FCI or government intervened in the market. Farmer had choice either to sell to the market or to the government. If price prices are low, lower than market price, then farmers go to the government and government buy it. Once government procure the food grains, then government distribute to the PDS system. This is how minimum score price and food security link with each other. Agree? How minimum score price is linked with food security? In minimum score price position, I'm repeating in minimum sport price policy, government announced floor prices. Farmer had a choice either to sell to the government or to the market. Now, if the market price is lower than minimum sport price, then as a profit maximizer, farmer tend to go to the government. And government procures food grains and then after that they distribute to the poor. Now, procuring the food grains from the farmers. It's a trade distorting score. If the government is announcing minimum score price, it is a trade distorting score. But if the government is distributing food grades, even free, even one rupees, two rupees, or even free, it is allowed under WTO. It is allowed under WTO. And it's come under green box. And what is the green box? Green box we consider as minimum trade distorting subsidies. Minimum 
create distorting subsidies. In that subsidies, any country, whether you are developed country, you are developing country or LDC country, you are free to give unlimited subsidies to agriculture sector. Now, in case of India, if government is spending money on the PDS and giving free food or charging less prices or giving at a subsidized rate, then that subsidy is a part of the green box. However, to distribute the food grains, government has to procure food grains from the farmer. The procurement of food grains from the farmer is an amber box. See, you have to understand this question, otherwise you will not uh, understand the whole lecture. Minimum score price is the amber box subsidies. Why is amber box subsidies? Government announced minimum score price. Then, as a farmer, you have incentive to cultivate a specific crop. So it means if your MSP is high, you will tend to cultivate more and more that specific crop. It means you will have more production. If you have more production, either you will import less or you will export more. So this way you will tend to distort the agriculture trade. So minimum score price policy is a trade distorting score and it's come under the amber box. Whereas distribution of food grains at subsidized rate is come under green box. So these are the two things you have to understand. Now, in India, in India, India is free to give green box support as other countries. But in minimum support price policy, India limit is only 10% of value of food grain production. In case of wheat, it is 10% of value of wheat. In case of rice, it is 10% of value of rice, water, is like that. In non-product specific support, we don't have any problem. We have problem only and only in product specific. And if we have problem in product specific sport, then it means we have to scrap minimum sport price policy. Because otherwise India will violate the provisions of the WTO. But the problem here is that the way the product specific sport is calculated, this is the fundamental flaws. How the product specific score is calculated is there is a fundamental problem. <clears throat> See, this is the formula of calculating product specific score. This is a simple formula. How to calculate minimum uh, this product specific score for wheat or rice? What is the formula? For example, you have to calculate for 2014. If you want to calculate Product specific score. You have to compare minimum score price. This R, uh, this is not R R B party. This is applied administrator price, or we can say M S, or minimum score price. It is minimum score price of 2014. Minimum score price of 2014 minus E R P. E R P. What E R P is the external reference price. It is the external reference price, ER. It is the price of 1986-88 export price or import price. Multiplied by procurement. Multiplied by procurement. This whole figure should be less than 10% of value of wheat in 2014. This is the provisions of under the agreement on agriculture. I am repeating again what is the formula minimum score price of 2014 minus ERP of 1988-89 multiplied by procurement quantity. Now, I should ask you a very simple question whether this formula is logical or not. It's totally illogical. Now, for example, after your master, if you go in the low market and if you earn, for example, 50,000 rupees per month after that, and your father while earning in 1986-88 2000 rupees or 5000 rupees, can you say that you are better off than your father? No way. 
because we are not considering inflation we are not considering the cost of standard of living but for the farmer community this is the farmer here the price the msp of 2014 minus erp 88 86 prices then you multiply by procurement and this should be less than 10% of value of production i am giving a simple calculation i am not going to the data but i am trying to show here that if you don't consider inflation if you don't consider inflation then india this is i did calculation for wheat or hypothetical crop i had taken if we don't consider inflation then india's domestic product specific export is 23% of value of products 23% it means india is violating agreement on agriculture so other country can take us to the dispute and we have ultimately we have to scrap our minimum for price but here india played uh, some tricky thing in, but india did instead of instead of notifying or calculating the subsidy in rupees india did the calculation in us dollar the second point instead of doing calculation in rupees see how the currency also matter in rupees terms you have 23% but the same calculation when i did in us dollar then it is minus 3.75% the same data same data just i used the us dollar in the rupees terms we are giving huge score to the farmers of wheat whereas when we do the calculation in us dollar we are taxing our farmers why it happened because in 1986-88 the exchange rate was 30 uh, 13.62 and now the exchange rate is 62 times your currency has depreciated so here instead of inflation we use the exchange rate and that's why till now we are under 10% till now we are under 10% if we calculate this in rupees then we have already violated way back in 1999 now if we consider inflation then we are taxing our farmer minus 57% if we consider inflation but under agreement on agriculture we can't consider inflation now you are not considering inflation and your formula is totally wrong you are comparing msq of 2014 with prices of 1986 about to violate 10% but when we do consider inflation then we are not giving much for to our farm we are taxing our farm now there is one provision in agreement on agriculture that we can consider inflation we can consider inflation now there is problem with that provision what is the problem for example if i have to calculate for 2014 then i will calculate in rupees then i will go to the member like members are sitting there 160 members i i will go there and present my case that no the inflation is there would you allow me to consider inflation now it's your choice whether to allow me to consider inflation or not if you don't allow then i already violated it so there is ambiguity about inflation now what is the problem now this is the rice data india has notified in us dollar you can see that in 2010 and 11 india is giving 7% of value of production of rice now when i did the calculation by 2015 and 16 india would violate this 10% limit 
If India violates limit, then what will happen? You developed country, US, EU, Australia, Canada, they would take us to the dispute. If they take us to the dispute and if we are violating this agreement to 10% limit, then there would be a dispute settlement body, they would give their decision, and then we have to scrap our minimum court price policy. Now, can you imagine that if we scrap our minimum court price policy, then what would be the impact on farmers? Due to WTO, we have to reduce that. See, all country gives support. All countries, whether you talk about US, whether you talk about EU, Canada, any country. When I did the calculation, Indian farmers hardly, a farmer in India hardly get on an average 300 US dollar per annum. At max, on an average. If you are a farmer in US, you are getting subsidies of around 36,000 US dollar per annum. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that whether this is the playing field that a farmer in India has to compete with a farmer of the US? Can you compare this? Take the case of the cotton, leave it. Cotton is in the Vidharva region. Just imagine that the cotton price has come down drastically now. And even yesterday I was uh, watching the television and the, about few farmers are also big society in Vidharva region. You compare the farmers in US who are producing cotton. You compare the cost of cultivation of USA farmer and Indian farmer. The cost of cultivation in USA of producing cotton is six times but the cost of cultivation in India. Even then, USA is number one exporter of cotton. Can you imagine this? And then they say that India is distorting the trade. They are getting more than 36,000 US dollars to 40,000 US dollars, and then they are blaming India that we are distorting the trade. This is the main problem. And even the, this problem is not specific to India. I am not talking about India. Developing country also has a problem. Take the case of Pakistan. Pakistan also has a similar kind of minimum for price. For wheat. And when I did the calculation, Pakistan already violated. India would violate in 2015 or 16. Pakistan already violated. But Pakistan had to be visited by US. When I went to Geneva uh, for the Committee on Agriculture meeting, Pakistan is raising issue that why India is giving minimum for price. Though they are violating the minimum for they are in it, themselves they are implementing the minimum support price. But they are saying India is giving huge support to the agriculture sector. This minimum support price policy is trade distorting and India should scare this policy. But even Pakistan is giving their support. India has not violated. I am saying India will violate by 2016 17 the 10% limit. But Pakistan already violated in 2008, 9, 10, 11. I did the calculation. China. China will also violate by 2016. Kenya also violated. Turkey. Zambia. Zimbabwe. I did the calculation for 15 countries. And these countries also violated the 10%. But in the negotiation, India was single out. And once they single out, they say that due to India, this problem has been much. But it's not specific. See, in developed country, they also give the price for. In developed country, they also. But their programs are compatible with the agreement to agriculture. Why? Because they made their, those provisions. They made those provisions, so that's why these provisions are, their program are compatible with them. Our programs are not compatible with WTO provisions. In 1995, when we signed the agreement, it's not a specific case of India. Most of the developing countries, they, they just went there, not, uh, they have not done any research on the WTO related issue. They signed in the good faith. But the good faith that developed country told 
then they will produce the subsidies, and then the farmers and the local country benefit. It not happen. Now, once developing country realize their mistake, they are raising their issue. Once they are raising their issue, developed country are blaming them. USA is spending 94 billion US dollar in food security. 94 billion US dollar. Can you imagine? The US. Whereas, what the Indian government is spending? Nothing. How much are Indian farmers are getting? Not much. Even we government announced minimum support price policy for 24 crores. For how many crores Indian government procured? Not more than 4 crores. Indian government is not playing active. Rice, wheat, metric max, sometimes important. Nothing. Even then, US is blaming us. Now, there was problem with this provision. And India raised this issue in 2000. Once we raised this 2000, then the one negotiation started in 2001. Over the period of time, the African group, then G33, raised this issue. And we told them that we want solution of this problem. We can't change our programs according to the WTO. See, there are a lot of debates going on that we, within India, and frankly speaking, within India, that we should scrap minimum for price points. There are a lot of problems with minimum for price points. Within India, I'm talking about. My point is this, okay, you, there are a lot of problems with minimum for price policy. You want to scrap it, scrap it. But you should not do under the pressure of WTO. Why you want to compromise at the external front? But the Indian intellectuals are saying that WTO has given us very good opportunity to scrap or discontinue the minimum support price policy. This is the talking point. I'm saying, okay, minimum support price policy has a lot of problems. Do your domestic reform. Why do you want to restrict the outside? You should have flexibility. You should have policy space to implement your welfare scheme. Once you go there and you bind yourself, then nothing we can do. You have problem in fertilizer subsidy, you have problem in canal subsidy, power subsidy. Do your domestic reform. Why you want to link with international trade? Why you want to buy yourself? So these type of suggestions are coming even from the Indian intellectuals. I agree, there are a lot of problems with domestic agriculture, but don't link with that international trade. You should have flexibility at the external front, whether you scrap it or continue. It's up to you. It's a domestic issue. But once you erode your policy space, in future you will not be able to be benefit. For example, cotton. If they know minimum support price policy for cotton, then what will happen to farmer in Duharba? Tell me, now that China has stopped importing cotton, cotton prices have come down from 6,000 rupees to 3,600. Need the policy space. So that was the fundamental problem when we raised this issue about food security. That if we don't raise this issue, we are ten we are going to give it in near future. Once we violate and if we don't raise this issue, we have to scrap this. This is the problem, that's why we have raised this issue since 2000. Now in 2008. The negotiations were there. We raised the issue that US and EU should reduce the subsidies. In the negotiation, instead of reducing their subsidies, they are demanding special provision for themselves. They are demanding special provision for themselves. They are saying that we should need more boxes so that they don't have to reduce their subsidies. In USA, USA has flexibility to give subsidies up to 19 billion per annum. What is the flexibility of India to give support? If India grows 10%, zero. If India grows 10% limit, India can't give. They have no flexibility to give any support. 
But if you are the USA, then even if you cross the de minimis limit, you can give even above up to 19 billion. So when they are talking about fair trade, why they don't reduce the subsidies? They have to reduce their subsidies. Then why they are raising the issue? India is demanding that yes, if you are a developed country, you should reduce the subsidies. And as a developing country, we need special and differential treatment for us. But they are saying no, India is an emerging economy. We should not allow India to go away with this. And what is the ultimate objective? That you reduce the minimum score price policy, you scrap it. Ultimately, your production will low. USA has more production, they will be able to export. Take that example of cotton. In cotton, USA farmer and Indian farmer competing. If India, for example, India don't give any support to farmer now, next year who will cultivate cotton? Then, in, then USA has a monopoly in the cotton. In, in African country, there is one group, C4 country. In African country, there is one group we call C4 country. They are very small country. Benin, Basso, Chad, these are the few countries. They are the 70% of export. 70% of their export is only cotton. Now, what they are saying to LDC country that due to Indian policy, that your farmer are suffering. And when we go to the Geneva for the negotiation, then African country also raise this issue. So this is very, that's why initially I started with that it's the hard to negotiation, where you have to fight with developed country as well as you also have to manage developing and countries. Given this problem, India raised this issue in 2008 model in the document about food security. In 2008, uh, initially they, India started in 2006, then 2008, but India demanded. What is the demand of India in 2008 or 9? Very simple, you have to understand what India had demanded. India asked that if a developing country Please focus on this. If a developing country procure food grains, procure food grains from a low income or resource poor farmer, if India procure food grains from low income or resource poor farmer, then that should come under green bonds. That India demanded. If Indian government procure rice meat from a low income or resource poor farmer, then that subsidy should come under the green bonds. Now, who are low income or resource poor farmer? As I told you, that we are defined on the basis of land holding. A farmer, if a farmer has land holding up to 10 hectares, that farmer is low income or resource poor farmer. So, a 99.2% farmer are categorized as low income or resource poor. Please don't mix this low income resource poor farmer definition with the domestic definition. Like small farmer, marginal farmer. Why we have adopted that definition? Because we want more flexibility. You have to understand the logic. Why we have defined the low income resource poor farmer? So if Indian government procures from a low income or resource poor, then it should be under green. So it means our 99% of procurement would go to under green bonds. That is our demand. So if that is our demand, then we don't have any problem in production. This issue we have raised in 2008. Now, negotiation started. USA was not interested at all in the negotiation because they don't want to reduce their subsidies at all. Now, 2008 onwards, you know that international prices of agriculture community have gone up after food crisis. Due to this, USA at present are not giving much subsidies. At present, they are not giving at subsidies as they were giving in 2006 
now they are saying that india's minimum support for price policy should be scrapped and india further their demand now we have to protect our minimum support price policy so there was statement in the negotiation between us and eu us and india then this bali conference came in the bali conference just few months before bali conference in 2013 india raised this issue again and developed country they were interested in other agreement for a trade facilitation agreement trade facilitation agreement this trade facilitation agreement was a recent phenomenon where the food security was the order they were pressing their proposal that all countries should sign the trade facilitation agreement whereas india said told them that no we will not sign this agreement first of all you have to solve this problem related to food security so india uh, g33 and india is a member of that group proposed they have put forward three proposals in 2013 what about the proposal one proposal was that we should consider excess inflation as i told you that if we consider inflation we have more flexibility second option one of the option was the peace clause one of the option was peace clause and third option was that instead of taking er to 9086888 we should take the dissent three options were put forward by the government but what what is the peace clause second inflation third change in er and there was agreement on the peace clause and what was the peace clause that if a developing country violate 10% limit for food grains then other country would not take us to the dispute would not take us to the dispute even if we violate 10% percent limit and we will work for the permanent solution within 4 years that was the bali package that within 4 years we will find a permanent solution for this problem and the meanwhile india agreed to sign the facilitation agreement so 2013 december or indian government are also happy indian minister are also happy all parties in the wq were happy but what happened after 2013 after 2013 there are you can say the, there are lot of progress on the trade facilitation agreement and there are no progress at all on the food security trade facilitation agreement because the developed country was interested so they were pushing that proposal whereas food security they are doing then there are other problems Developed countries they start uh, writing that this peace clause is available only for four years. This peace clause is only available only for four years. That if we are not able to find a permanent solution, if there is no consensus among developing country or member country within four years, then peace clause is there, and then any country can take us to the dispute. so that developed country they start demanding that and on the other hand they were pushing india to sign trade facilitation agreement in july 2014 india refused to sign india refused to sign trade facilitation agreement and india told us and the developed country that until unless there is a progress on wto negotiation especially on the permanent solution we will not sign the facilitation agreement once we have refused to sign there are attack from wide media as well as indian media even indian intellectual uh, written a lot of things about indian negotiator they say that indian negotiator are stupid why they are taking care of the farmer what are the issues of the this agriculture sector we should go for the trade facilitation 
and you know that you are a student of economics, you, and you know the econometric uh, how the people use. It's a tool. People also, it all depends how you use that tool. They have put forward one study by using a CD model, general equilibrium model. And they told that if tail facilitation agreement sign, then the world welfare would increase by 3 trillion US dollars. Then the next study they say that no 4 trillion. Just you feed the data, you get something. I'm also using the CD model. I know the integrity of that. You put something, you'll get something. You reduce the tariff, you reduce the subsidy to welfare increase. But what is the welfare? I am not able to understand it. How you measure the welfare? So India refused to sign this and we got attacked. So different proposals come domestically. But say you should scrap minimum for price policy. India negotiator, negotiator are stupid. India has a laughing stock in the multilateral negotiation. You just pick any news article for the last minute and a half. Just you pick and you read that. That India's position was highly, highly criticized. And they written that the WTO is doomed just because India's position. You just pick and you just search on the internet, you will get all these things. But India took step. They said, no, we will not sign. Whatever you say. And if we agreed to their demand, then what would happen? That after four years, they again would start say, blackmailing us. So India took step. That no, for the food security purpose, we have to take strong step. And even see, it's very easy to go to the WTO and say that we should scrap minimum for price policy. It's a very political sensitive issue. It's very, very political sensitive issue. Even government was not able to scrap this minimum for price policy. There is demand going on like direct subsidies of fertilizer. There is demand going on that we should give direct subsidies to fertilizer. It's okay, you do the domestic reform. We have no problem. But in WTO, we have flexibility. So in July 2014, we had demanded this. And then, a lot of criticism was there, Indian media and Western media. Once it was there, India took a firm stand. And then after some time, USA agreed to it. Because we took a stand. See, that's a hardcore negotiation. That's the example I am given. Like when you go to the fruit vendor, what do you do? We have apple kitchen, you have 100 rupees. Then you have 80 rupees. Then you go. After the day, then you go. After the day, then you go. Then you go. Then you go. This is the things you do. These are the things you do. These are pressure tactics. See, in the WTO also you have to do the pressure tactics. This happened. I am giving the, this example. What happened after 2030? If we submit to their demand, then what would happen to our farmers? We can't give direct subsidies or direct money to farmers. We have a lot of problems. The land holding reports are not updated. To whom you will give subsidies, direct subsidies? To an owner, to a dealer, to grandfather or grandchildren. You don't know. See, the policy or program should be compatible with your social economic situation prevailing in your country. It should not be according to WTO provisions. That is the fundamental point. You can't change all your programs according to WTO provisions. If WTO say no, you have to scrap, no. You can't do that. So then USA agreed, and now we are starting finding a permanent solution on this. And still, we are doing a lot of research for finding a permanent solution. But we did. Even two interns from your institute also came to my center for internship. We did calculate the subsidies of 13 countries, and we found that these 30 countries have violated the agreement of agriculture. We went to our commerce minister sent the confidential report that time and it was the, on the peak. And we are sure that these are the country at the violated. We have sent a specific report to specific ambassador. We also presented our case uh, in front of 
30 ambassadors, 30 ambassadors of the developing and LDC country. Where we have shown that it's not only the developing country, but also African country also facing this problem. So due to this, now the lot of progress is going on for finding a permanent system. But the point here is that if to agriculture you have to protect, the farmer community here in India can't compete with a highly subsidized agriculture sector in the US. And this is a hardcore negotiation you have to protect. No country will come forward to protect your interest. No country will come. If you think that the other country will come, no. In 2001, when negotiations started, it was written that it will provide spatial and differential treatment. What is a spatial and differential treatment in both Prima? Nothing. You didn't get any spatial and differential treatment till now. It's only on the paper. So if you have to get it, you have to do research, you have to demand it, and you have to take a firm stand. And that is the stand the government of India has taken. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your insightful speech. We would not now like to open your house for question and answer session. Please raise your hands and the volunteers will pass on the mic. I think you are very in a very elaborate way you have explained what this animal WTOD I think from the if one in a in if you are on that place describe it in one word WTO in the world terrorist organization. <laughs> And why I say so it and seriously is because you see at now these boxes and we have to come out of the box, we have to come out of these boxes, which is an international design because whether it was a tree, tree, the garden quota, on everything that uh, uh, WTO has gone back and after 20 years. So I think the and it is a very nicely said at the end of the world. Lecture that this is all political jal khada ho. Of course, this is a world negotiation, is a political process, and development is a political process. Let us not deny that. And even that, I think, the kind of political process in which we are engaged in is not at all in the country interest. Because you should please recall, please when the Congress signed it. BJP, BJP was in some ways opposed, but they came around. Now BJP wants to do it in the manner. So they are, I think, in a way, pulling the farmers of India, number one, number two, the consumers of India, and number three, I think time has come when across the uh subject was security after the food. Right, bill is passed. Uh, I think the food security is going to be directly affected. And if there is any food security, I think we also have to think internally that producing food in a Punjab and taking it to Kerala, producing rice in Punjab, which is not a paddy land, and you call it an efficient public distribution system. So I think there has to be a, the point I'm trying to make a paradigm shift. The food security can only be a local, ecological food security, and let us not bother about this. Terrorist organization, the toiling people of the world. Thank you, sir, for a good question. 
सर इसे वर्ल्ड टेररिस्ट ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ओके ये जो आपसे मेंबर हो गया है ऑर्गेनाइजेशन दैट्स अ प्रॉब्लम ओके
the audience very close. So what are the kind of arguments that the supporters give and what are the kind of pressure tactics that they put on us during the day? Price. So, we are not suppressing our prices, we are trying to protect the farmers. 